Remarkable in their coverage of the life of Dan Flood and this final tribute for them. And we thank all of them for what they have done to make the community conscious of somebody who lived his four score and ten years and could easily have been forgotten by a generation. And we do thank them. This morning's uh, Scranton paper, though, the mayor would have noticed when I did, it started off by saying raised to sainthood, which I thought even Dan might think would be a little much to ask, but it turned out it is the Orthodox Church have a Saint Alexis. That, but it didn't surprise me totally when I had seen it. We, we did tell a lot of the, the Dan Flood stories, and one we, when Mike and I had a chance to tell a few on television, the one that I remember somebody told me, I was not a witness to it, that he was having a hearing and he was helping a German scientist who had a, pro, a program that Dan was interested in and he was leaning over helping him to make the presentation and he was saying, Herr Doctor, tell them how much good this is going to do mankind. Herr Doctor, ex tell them to them and the fellow stopped and he said, uh, Mr. Chairman, I never finished my degree and I'm not a doctor. And Dan leaned over and he said, Herr Doctor, when this chair calls you a doctor, you are a doctor. <laughs> It, it wouldn't take much to encourage me on that. Uh, Garrison Keeler in the press club said something kind of remarkable the other day. He said he's not high on his own generation because he looks in amazement at the generation that went before him who knew what depression was and they knew what war was and they knew what unemployment was and he thinks that gave them a chance to be more appreciative. I who have not always maybe the members of the uh, political life that are here in front of me will attest have maybe been as kind as I should have been to political leaders at all time. But I hope they trust it has been done in good spirit because good politicians, as much as a forgiving church, understand human nature. They're realistic about human nature. They're not crushed by ingratitude. They have an understanding of what happens and that there is a certain percentage of people respond and they're not wounded by it. And as long as we have people of caliber, so many of whom are gathered here, to continue the political life of this country, we, I think, are well served. And Dan was so much like that. In our liturgy ceremony, in this leave taking, the word liturgy says what one does to identify themselves. If you were a baker, the baking was your liturgy. If you're in political life, all that we've heard from Father Lackenmeyer so well is what your responsibilities are. Scriptures have a statement at the end of John. When you're young, you put a cincture about yourself and you go any place you want to go. But when you're older, another ties a cincture about you and takes you where maybe you would rather not go. And I think the cincture is political life. It makes demands beyond imagination. And it's rare we find somebody who so lived up to those demands and seemed almost to thrive on them, but served them in some fashion. There's a, a strange story of Jacob and the angel in the scriptures. And a fellow named John Forsythe had a book out on it. I never understood the story. In the story, Jacob took this messenger of God and they wrestled all night and neither could overcome the other. And finally, in the morning, the angel reached over and crippled Jacob. And he limped away from the fray. And that ended the battle where he was defeated. And John Forsythe said, what the message is that unless you're wounded, unless you're defeated, unless you're hurt, unless you limp, you never can reach the potential of who you are as a human being. And we found that in Dan. His better years were his final acceptance when he came back home, the wounded warrior and part of us. William Butler Yeats said, nature framed in fault, there is comfort now and then, and salt. Nature usually bad, base, even blind. Clearly, thou canst occasionally be kind. We're going to have tributes from the, the people who've shared Dan's life so much. They will come without introduction, and they all have a message. Governor Casey. First to Catherine, I bring the sincere condolences of the people of Pennsylvania in your loss, which all of us share today. The Dan Flood stories, of course, are as numerous as the people in this church. One of the stories I like of all of those is 
when the senator, the late senator Martin L. Murray used to tell, that, can, that involved the senator himself. One day when, during a campaign, President Kennedy came here to campaign in Luzerne County. And uh, of course, he was met at the airport in the big white Cadillac convertible and in the front seat sat uh, Senator Murray in the back seat, Congressman Flood and President Kennedy. And as they left the airport, they came down toward Wilkes-Barre and every 100 feet or so were these huge billboards if you recall when Dan would run, he didn't have to buy much advertising, but he would always buy these big billboards. And of course, on the billboards was one word. You guessed it, flood, in letters about 10 feet high. And Kennedy saw about 10 of these, and flood, 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 flood. And finally he turned to Dan and said, hey, Dan, don't you have any Kennedy signs? <laughs> And Dan didn't bat an eye. He reached up to Marty Murray and said, yeah, Marty, where are the Kennedy signs? <laughs> we come together today to celebrate the life of Daniel J. Flood. He has been called an American original, larger than life. One of the most powerful men in America the best congressman in the country. He was, of course, all of these things. But to his people, his people, he was something more. To the retired coal miner who came to Dan for help with those telltale dark blue marks on his hands and face from where the cuts and the bruises and the bumps got dirt in them, never quite healed, the same fellow with lungs like concrete from black lung, struggling for breath. To him, Dan Flood was something more. To the widow who wrote to him for help because she needed medical care for a sick child which she couldn't afford, to her, Dan Flood was something more, something much more. The legacy of Dan Flood can be seen all around us. Yes, in public buildings and landmark legislation which bear his name. But even more, we can see that legacy in the minds and hearts of his people. Because Dan Flood never forgot his roots. He never forgot where he came from. He never forgot his people. Dan Flood needs no monument of steel or stone because his monument is in the lives of the people, the people he helped in ways large and small, the people to whom he brought hope. And so today we celebrate that life which brought help and hope to so many. And we find in the liturgy and in our faith an echo of that hope because just as Dan Flood was larger than life, our faith teaches us that he is larger than death. And so today, in the spirit of that faith, we come to say to Dan Flood, not goodbye, but till we meet again. Dan would have liked this audience. He always liked to talk to a large crowd. It brought out a special magic to him. Those of us that had the pleasure of knowing Dan during his lifetime all have a story, as the governor has said. Mine goes back to just when I was a wee child, really, in the late 40s, when uh, Catherine and Dan were married, if you recall. He had a special place in Nanticoke, and they held a mock wedding. And I had the pleasure of playing Dan in that mock wedding when I was all of nine years of age. And from that point on until the last moment I talked to Dan Flood, when I talked to him on the occasion of his 90th birthday, he was always the congressman to me. And uh, although I've held that role 
for some years, and I have my colleagues who have succeeded, Dan. We all knew that in Luzerne County, in northeastern Pennsylvania, in the 11th Congressional District, Dan Flood would always be the congressman. And as I sat here and listened to Father Lackemeyer and the governor talk, I wonder why that is and how so many of us in our lifetime will identify someone as a baker, as a doctor, as a teacher, or as a congressman. And how do you get to be that? How are you that? Dan was, I guess, first and foremost an actor before it was easy for an actor to be in politics. If you know, he preceded Donald Reagan by, or Ronald Reagan by a number of years. But you know, Dan just wasn't an actor. He was a Shakespearean actor. He always had that magic touch. He understood that he had to move people beyond themselves. And then he became a lawyer and he did it with great flair. Last night, I listened to the late Lou Feldman describe Dan's first case. And only those of us that knew Dan Flood could ever believe that he could appear to have been a seasoned member of the bar in trying his first case between, before an appellate court. And then there were those of us in Luzerne County that remember Dan Flood. He came to power when coal was just dying in 1944. And he shepherded our area through a growth of a district and a demise of a population. He saw the weaknesses of a single central industrial might, and he saw the scars and the wear of that upon the people. And he rose to that special occasion as only he could. He rose to the level of being one of 537 elected people that run this government. But he just didn't do it for a while. He did it for 32 years. He entered the Congress of the United States at just the last end of the Second World War and served in eight presidencies and served with distinction. I don't know what our final resolve will be or what history will say of Dan. Maybe it will be written after we're gone and in a different light than we would see it. But as I see Dan Flood, he had that special magic of a human being to know when people were hurt, to provide for them, to lend an ear for those who were not as articulate as some, and then a driving force, as the governor said, to never forget from whence he came. In 32 years in the Congress of the United States, Dan Flood met and knew every president, spent time at the White House and in palaces, and houses of leadership throughout the world. But when his term was done, he came back to his house on North Main Street, and he returned to become one of us. If that's how we would define a congressman, I can't think of a finer description. And yes, Dan, I saw a cartoon in the Times later today and it shows Dan and his wings going off to the Golden Gate. And I know damn well he was going and saying, Murph, I'm here. And St. Peter would have taken back a little bit of a start. And he'd say, Murph, where's the boss? <laughs> and he'll leave us with the million stories that we've all experienced, the pleasant thoughts, but most of all, He's left us richer than we would have been if he hadn't come. Farewell, Dan. Monsignor McGowan and members of the clergy, <clears throat> lovely Catherine, and friends one and all of Dan Flood. You know, it would be a dreadfully hard thing if we'd come here today in the gentle breezes of this Memorial Day celebration just to mourn Dan Flood. Think of what we've already heard 
None of us are here just to mourn Dan, Catherine. We're here to celebrate a life, the life of a man who was bigger than life and whose spirit lives on, touching each and every one of us still. Where do we begin to tell of Dan Flood? Dressed in all white, he showed his theatrical flair. He played Tondaleo in White Cargo. People described him with words like dapper and flamboyant. He was the white Cadillac outside the Union Hall. And he was the best Irish coffee at the best St. Patrick's Day dinner ever held. The world was his stage. And all his life he played the lead and never shunned the spotlight. Oh, I remember so many times before going to the well of the House of Representatives to bring up a very complex bill. Everybody would stand around tense and wonder not if we were going to get it passed. And if Dan were managing the bill, he would look around just before the gavel came down to begin the session, and he would say, gentlemen, curtain up. <laughs> he always gave us his all. He never let the audience down, and he never let his constituents down. He did so much. You know, when the circus came to the nation's capital, people took their children and they watched from the sidelines. Not Dan. He rode the biggest elephant, complete with cape and cane and top hat, and led the parade around all the rings as the circus made its way around. Of course, he had the biggest smile of anybody in the audience, and of course, he got the most thunderous ovation. And at the end of the parade, I used to just love to be near him, because as he finished that round to the thunderous applause, he would say, if only Shakespeare could see me now. <laughs> only Dan called President John F. Kennedy Jack, and Secretary of Defense Robert F. Kennedy, Robert F. McNamara, Mac. He was a fighter term congressman, and he loved a good fight. He had the biggest hands that I have ever seen. And guess what, friends? He had the softest touch that I've ever seen. Came to Washington because he wanted to help his neighbors, and he did. It was the Flood Douglas Bill for distressed communities. There was the Back Lung Bill. There was money for cancer research. There was money for mine safety. Those big hands were helping hands. And they were always, Catherine, always there. He was, as has been said, a cardinal in the College of Cardinals. That was the select body of men who decided where federal dollars would be spent. And he always used the word powerful when he talked about the Appropriations Committee. And Dan was a powerful, extraordinarily powerful man. But friends, he used that power on behalf of black lung widows the fellow next door who was down on his luck and lost his job, the college student, the senior citizen, the tired and the sick. He used to say, I have lots of power, chum. Lucky I'm a nice guy. I can help a lot of nice people. And he did. He was also Dean Flood, Dean of our Pennsylvania congressional delegation. Oh, he could charm an admiral or a general, and he could terrorize a bureaucrat or a politician. If it was for Pennsylvania, he was your friend. Don't touch Toby Hanna. And one of his great efforts, don't give away the Panama Canal. I often think that if Dan were in the Senate, we'd still be arguing about whether or not to cede the Panama Canal. No doubt his finest hours came amidst our darkest hours. When the floods of Hurricane Agnes ravished our towns in 1972, Dan announced to the world, this is one flood against another, and I intend to win. And he did. He led the healing and the recovery. He got people back in their homes and back on their feet. His success was our reward. And I think it's so fitting that we celebrate this life in an extended period of remembrance for both Memorial Day and D-Day, and that we commend Dan's life and his stewardship. He joins those heroes, Catherine,
who have given their last full measure of devotion to their country. Oh, we all know Dan is an old Shakespearean actor. And I went to Shakespeare to see if I could find something that summed his life, and I think maybe I have. Words from Julius Caesar. His life was gentle, and the elements so mixed in him that nature might stand up and say to all the world, this was a man. For Dan loved his country, he loved his neighbors, he especially loved his Catherine, the First Lady of our hearts, and we extend our love and our support and our thanks, Catherine, for being the support system for Dan through times good and through times bad. And while that rich and beautiful voice has now been stilled, let's lift our voices in praise of a gentle life, live fully and completely in the service of his fellow man. We say to all the world, this was a man. We bid him peace and rest. <clears throat> My father is James Lenahan Brown who was Dan's partner, and next to Catherine, his best friend. Dan was like a second father to me, and my sisters, and Catherine was like a second mother. Catherine has asked that I express her sincere thanks and gratitude for all the cards, flowers, and support that she has received over the last several days. Catherine, Dan will be missed by all. Reverend clergy, distinguished public officials, many of whom serve with Dan, ladies and gentlemen, and most of all, Catherine. The golden life of public service in caring for his fellow man has come to an end. The splendid prayers from his church, the eloquent tributes from his fellow public officials, and the unending admiration of the people of his region provide more than adequate testimony to the accomplishments of the giant who goes to his resting place today. No obituary, no eulogy, no tale of glory, or any political success could ever equal the affection, care, and decades of leadership which Daniel J. Flood provided to his people. Fourteen years after his retirement following 32 years in the United States House of Representatives, there has been produced for us not only a legend, but a standard of excellence to which all of us, be it in public affairs, private business, in our homes or in our families, must forever aspire. In over three decades in Washington, more than 100 men and women obtained their livelihood, their experience, their motivation for higher calling because they worked for Congressman Dan Flood. None of them could ever forget him just as none of the tens of thousands who were touched in some way by his larger-than-life leadership will always have Dan Flood to inspire them. Those who are privileged to serve in his office in Wilkes-Barre or in the Cannon Building in Washington all in some way felt that being part of the Dan Flood team was an experience of a lifetime, and it was. It was, day and night, whether in the glories of another election victory, or flying in a helicopter to land in the mud of Agnes, or taking the eloquent words of dictation, which identify with the substance and style, or in the reaching out to the small citizen who had no one else to turn to. These were the great experiences of life with Dan Flood. Now, gathered at the north end of Wilkes-Barre, in the church where he married the most dedicated woman of his dreams, here to say goodbye to the temporal presence of Dan Flood, we know truly that the, this region and its peaceful people will never say goodbye. Their memories will never fail them. Their libraries will forever give testimony, and the splendid edifices he built will always be evidence to the fact that Dan Flood was among us. I too thought of Shakespeare. You could not think of Dan Flood for too long and not think of Shakespeare. Now, the final curtain comes down. 
The stage of life on which he was a megastar is going dark as his leading lady looks on. He was a man inspired by Shakespeare who was proud to call himself a Shakespearean actor. In bidding adieu, no greater words could be summoned than those of farewell which William Shakespeare penned in The Merchant of Venice. Good night, sweet prince, and may flights of angels beckon thee to thy rest. I would just like to say a brief word on behalf of that valiant lady sitting in the front row. I have never heard my Aunt Catherine complain about her life because life with Dan <clears throat> was perfect as far as she was concerned. Much has been written of the glamorous side of her life, very little of the tragic, and there's been much of it in her life. Few people know that she, I hope I can get through this, lost her beloved mother when she was 12 years old. A scant 10 years later, a sister who died much too young. The very next year, she lost her beloved Papa. In all, she's lost four sisters, two brothers, a brother-in-law, sister-in-law, and what we used to refer to as her faithful friend and Indian companion, Naomi, of 35 years. But, as they say in the song, this time, Lord, you've given her a mountain. But she'll overcome this too. And those of us who love her are concerned about her today. And would like to share with you the words of a favorite poem of Dan in hopes that it may sustain her. It's written by Elsa Pascal Robinson and it's called To Those We Love. If I should ever leave you whom I love to go along the silent way, grieve not, nor speak of me with tears, but laugh and talk of me as if I were beside you there. I'd come, I'd come, could I but find a way. But would not tears and grief be barriers? And when you hear a song, or see a bird I loved, please do not let the thought of me be sad, for I am loving you just as I always have. You were so good to me. There are so many things I wanted still to do, so many things to say to you. Remember that I did not fear. It was just leaving you that was so hard to bear. We cannot see beyond, but this I know. I loved you so, t'was heaven here with you. We all know of Dan's support of and love of the theater. And with that in mind, may I ask you please to rise and offer with me one final standing ovation. Before we go our separate ways, let us take leave of our brother. May our farewell express our affection for him. May it ease our sadness, strengthen our hope. One day we shall joyfully greet him when the love of Christ, which conquers all things, destroys even death itself.
Almighty and ever-living God, to whom we place our trust and hope, and you, the dead, whose bodies are temples of the Spirit, find everlasting peace. We take leave of our brother, give our hearts peace and a firm hope that one day Dan will live at the mansion you prefer from heaven, and we ask this through Christ our word. Amen. Eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord. May he rest in peace. May his soul and the souls of all the faithfully parted to the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. Amen.
To say Daniel Flood was a legend in his own time is not an understatement. The Hazelton native chose law school over the theater, but his theatrical instincts went with him when he was elected to Congress for a career which would span 32 years. At the peak of his power, Flood served as chairman of two of the 12 U.S. House Appropriations Subcommittees, Defense and H.E.W. Labor, controlling a full third of the entire national budget. His flamboyant figure appeared on magazine covers, often in top hat and cape. On the floor of Congress, in committee hearings, and in meetings with lobbyists and constituents, Flood was faithful to his friends and frightening to his foes. Never was his influence more evident than when he took over control of the response to the devastating Agnes Flood of 1972, proclaiming it would be one flood against another. Ultimately, millions of dollars in federal aid flowed to the region in the recovery and reconstruction. He left his mark in other ways, in black lung benefit legislation, in support for the anthracite and railroad industries. The Tobyhanna Army Depot grew to become the region's largest employer. The Wilkes-Barre VA Medical Center was built, and the North Cross Valley Expressway was planned and started. At one time, Dan Flood was the system, but that system brought him down as he was charged with accepting bribes in return for influence, charged by what he termed desperate men under pressure. His first trial ended in a hung jury, but facing mounting legal defense costs and declining health, Dan Flood pleaded guilty to a single count of bribery in 1979 and resigned. Last couple of years. Are you at all bitter at all about your career, or do you, do you, can you not, sit back? Not in the slightest. I'm very happy with those 30 years in Congress serving my country. He would return to the North Pennsylvania Avenue home he shared with his wife, Catherine, surrounded by memories and mementos. But as we overlook the region Dan Flood loved and served, protected, nurtured, and ultimately helped to rebuild, the record will show much of what Dan Flood worked for and stood for will continue to stand. After being elected for the third time in the 40s, Dan Flood's rise to power was a steady one, and after just a few terms in office, he was the ranking member of the powerful Defense Appropriations Committee, which controlled roughly about one-half the federal budget. As the years went by, Dan Flood gathered praise and criticism, both locally and nationally. He was flamboyant and lived to be on stage, appearing once on the cover of Harper's Bazaar. Flood was demanding on his staff in Washington, and while he brought home the bacon for his district, he did so at great personal sacrifice, having almost no personal life. Pennsylvania Congressman Daniel Flood, under investigation on a number of charges, today was identified as the recipient of a $5,000 bribe. Six years after Flood brought the Wyoming Valley back from the ravages of Hurricane Agnes, his world would begin to unravel as he was indicted for accepting $62,000 in payoffs in an influence peddling scam. Uh, I completely deny all of these assertions and their implications as well. In 1979, Flood's trial ended as a mistrial after one of the jurors refused to vote in favor of conviction. A year later, in the face of failing health and another trial, Flood pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor just to end his ordeal, as he put it. It's one flood against another. That's what the congressman declared in June of 1972 as floodwaters from Hurricane Agnes began to ravage his beloved Wyoming Valley. Perhaps it was his greatest and most memorable accomplishment that in the following few months, Dan Flood would secure most of the federal money that was used to rebuild a place like Wilkes-Barre's Public Square. Perhaps that's why today Governor Casey said Dan Flood won't need a monument in his honor because the monument of his accomplishments will live on in the minds of the people he served. I'm Brian Francis, Eyewitness News. This is the Wilkes-Barre home Dan Flood shared with his wife of 45 years. It's nestled in a middle-class neighborhood on the city's north side. The once powerful politician could have lived anywhere, and the fact that he chose to stay here gives us an idea of what Dan Flood was all about. 
And if you knew him for more than two hours, you, you thought of him as a friend. Hugh Campbell met Congressman Dan Flood 40 years ago, and they worked together on many legislative projects throughout the years. Campbell has many fond memories of the former congressman who is known for his feisty, flamboyant, and yet down-to-earth style. There was an old story about uh, somebody uh, went into a beer store one day and got a case of beer because five of them were going uh, out to uh, a fishing party. And the congressman showed up and said, you need a speaker. And, uh, you know, he had that kind of reputation. He, he'd appear anywhere, he'd talk to anyone. And, and that quality endeared him to many. Michael Clark served as Flood's chief press aide for more than 15 years. I can remember a man that really cared about people and cared about programs and cared about the small man. And when you worked in his office as I did and you heard the mother calling because her husband died and they needed their son home from Korea for a funeral in a hurry and we had to find an Air Force jet and put him on it. You got the sense of what Dan Flood was all about. People who knew Dan Flood say he was always there to lend a helping hand to anyone who needed one whenever they needed one. Like neighbor Dottie Koshansky, she remembers Flood as a kind, giving man who never let his power inflate his ego. My fondest memory is when I danced with him at a 4th of July party over in Mr. and Mrs. Thomas's backyard. Dan Flood touched the lives of many in many different ways, and through their memories, he will live on for quite some years to come. In Wilkes-Barre, Carol McKenzie, Eyewitness News. Dan Flood was always known to draw a crowd. Well, he continued that even in death. More than 200 people attended the viewing Sunday of the former congressman from Wilkes-Barre. Friends, admirers, and just those who wanted to pay respects to the man once called the country's best congressman. Some people might say he was a character, but he was a good character. He was a very uh, caring person, and uh, he got your attention, and he got the attention of Washington and the whole country, actually. He has been very, very good for all of us. I found him so utterly warm and giving and uh, friendly, and we saw things together in the same way. He was always there when you needed him, and I'd call him at many hours in the night and day. He was there to answer the telephone, and he was the People's Congress. Flood served 32 years in Congress. He died Saturday at Mercy Hospital in Wilkesbury at the age of 90. Doctors say his frail body was racked by pneumonia, a stroke, and kidney failure. His passing ends an era in American politics and is being noted as such. Here's the itinerary for the next two days. Monday, today at 2 o'clock, Flood's body moved from funeral home to the Luzerne County Courthouse. At 3 o'clock till 8 o'clock this afternoon, he lies in state for public viewing. Tomorrow at 10.15 a.m., his funeral begins at McLaughlin Funeral Home in Wilkesbury. At 11 o'clock, the funeral continues at St. John the Evangelist Church in Wilkesbury. Burial will take place at St. Mary's Cemetery in Hanover Township, Luzerne County. The 109th Field Artillery will provide full military honors. The rotunda of the Luzerne County Courthouse is an impressive sight. 
The coffin sits surrounded by an honor guard of the 109th Field Artillery. An American flag is draped over the coffin. And Father James Lackenmeyer says prayers for the dead, prayers for his friend Dan Flood. Almost everyone is gone now except close family. The former congressman's widow, Catherine, sits and takes it all in. She cries as the honor guard picks up the casket and carries it out. For the previous five hours, she has listened, commented, and smiled graciously to the 800 people who come to say goodbye. Congressman Paul Kanjorski is one of them. He succeeded Dan Flood as representative of the 11th District. I think Dan uh, practiced what Tip O'Neill typified when he said all politics is local. Uh, he was very responsive to his constituents. And they remember. All day they come through the receiving line and offer a moment of silence or a prayer. It's believed Dan Flood is the first public official ever to lie in state here in the rotunda. As far as I know, I don't believe it's occurred in the past. However, I think that we have not ever had such a statesman. The flag-draped coffin leaves the courthouse with the military honor guard. A police escort leads the way, and this public farewell to the man called the best congressman of all is over. Donna Crilly, Eyewitness News, Luzerne County. They came to say goodbye to a good friend. Dan Flood's flag-draped casket sits in the Luzerne County Courthouse Rotunda, a place where he spoke so many times during his long and brilliant political career. Many who had once listened to the man with the unique wit and charm now come to say thanks, offer a prayer, and maybe just reflect. All the while, his widow tried to handle the duties once shared by both. The duties of a congressman who cared about his constituents. A congressman the likes of which we will never see again. I think Dan uh, practiced what Tip O'Neill typified when he said all politics is local. Uh, he was very responsive to his constituents. Here is the schedule for Dan Flood's farewell. At 10.15 this morning, the funeral procession leaves McLaughlin Funeral Home on South Franklin Street. A procession will go up North Main Street to St. John the Evangelist Church on North Main for an 11 o'clock funeral. After that funeral, burial will take place at St. Mary's Cemetery in Hanover Township. The flag-draped casket containing the body of Dan Flood is carried into St. John the Evangelist Church in Wilkesbury by a military honor guard. In life, Dan Flood always drew a crowd. In death, it was no different. People from all walks of life heard and told of Flood's love for his people. It wasn't only that Dan attended to your small requests. It was, it, it was that he made you think that yours was an important request and that he would deliver it for you. Dan Flood never forgot his roots. He never forgot where he came from. He never forgot his people. His widow, Catherine, fought back tears as the man who now holds the seat her husband did for 32 years spoke out. He had that special magic of a human being to know when people were hurt, to provide for them, to lend an ear for those who were not as articulate as some. Congressman Joseph McDade served with Flood in Washington for more than 20 years. He used that power on behalf of black lung widows, the fellow next door who was down on his luck and lost his job, the college student, the senior citizen, the tired and the sick. Then it was time to take Dan Flood to his final resting place at St. Mary's Cemetery in Hanover Township. Under sun-drenched skies, bagpipe music was played, music he loved so much. Then the traditional 21-gun salute and taps. Praise and cool. So while Dan Flood's life is over, there's little argument or doubt that his influence will be felt by generations to come. Andy Mahalshik, Eyewitness News, Luzerne County.